Morning, everyone. It's uh, good to see so many faces in the church, uh, especially without the masks. Um, but yeah, I think last time I was here, we I was speaking on First John two, the beginning of First John two, and uh, we've reached the end of First John in chapter five, um, and we'll be I'll be sharing on verse thirteen to twenty. So let's read it together. Um, verse thirteen to twenty. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have, we know that we have what we have asked of him. If anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin that doesn't lead to death, he should ask and God will give life to him. And to those who commit sin that doesn't lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I'm not saying he should pray about that. Or unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin that doesn't lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin. But the one who was born of God keeps him. And the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God. And the whole earth is under the sway of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one, that is, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Father, we thank you for your word and the ministry of your word. And we just pray that you would guide us today as we work our way through this last part of First John. Um, let your word speak for itself. Uh, show us what you want us to take from this. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, <clears throat> starting in verse 13, we read, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, from this verse, we know who John is talking to. Um, this letter is obviously addressed to the believer, to the believers of the time, um, to Christians. To you who believe in the name of the Son of God. John start, starts this final se section by restating the purpose of his letter, and he wanted them to have this assurance that they possess eternal life. Now, we, we know that John is saying these things in light of the Gnostics, Gnostic teaching developing among the church at the time, and they were questioning the issues relating to how one can be saved. Gnostics, or um, from the Greek word gnosis, uh, meaning knowledge, we're teaching people that if you didn't possess a special knowledge, then you couldn't be saved. That the only way to know God was to attain a special spiritual insight. And if you followed this certain group, then you were sure, they would surely teach you their ways and you would be well informed. John says no. John says that you can know that you have eternal life. That there is an assurance. That the only way... You can truly have this assurance is if the basis of your salvation is Christ alone. That's it. Nothing less. That the basis is Christ and not you. And if I try to fit myself into this equation, then it's bad news. If salvation is somehow dependent on a life that I can live or something that I can attain to, then it's no longer good news, but bad news. Because I'm not very consistent, to be honest. And I'm not very reliable. Um, I wish I was, but, I, but I'm not. Uh, and today we see all over the world uh, groups who try to rack up enough good deeds to impress God. Because to them, the issue of assurance and confidence is something they can never really have. I had an interesting conversation with a boy at the train station a couple weeks ago. He told me he believed in heaven. And when I asked him, well, how do we get to heaven? He answered, I don't know. But for us, we have this confidence that what Jesus did on the cross never changes. Uh, last, in last week's passage, we, we covered 1 John 5, 11, and I think it embraces uh, what, we're, what John is trying to say here in verse 13. So verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 11 in 1 John. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. 
Now in the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. See, our salvation is not based on anything we can do, but what Jesus has already done. To Tetelestai in the Greek. I uh, took a, a, a YouTube course on how to say that word. Um, I, hope it's, I hope it's right. Tetelestai. Um, and it's in perfect tense in the Greek. And it speaks of an action which has been completed in the past with results continuing into the present. It is finished, is what it translates to. And in the Old Testament, on the Day of, a, of Atonement, the priest would emerge from the temple to a waiting crowd and say, it is finished. So it's a term that the Hebrews are familiar with. And in the New Testament times, a worker would return to his employee and say, to tell a star to signal that the work assigned was completed. In a similar way, an artist would declare it is finished at the unveiling of a painting. The work is complete. No more touch-ups, no more adjustments. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Perhaps the most common use of the word to Telestai was at the, in debt collection, where a receipt was stamped with the word to Telestai, which meant that the debt was now paid in full. This was ver verification that the person was no longer responsible for any of that debt. So when John is speaking to the, to the early church, when he addresses them in this letter, to those who believe in the name of the Son of God, He's reminding them to take a look at their receipts. What does the stamp say? What does your stamp say? Because the work is finished, and if you receive him, you can know today with absolute certainty that you were born again and that you're saved. We move on to prayer in verse 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Now, Jesus has modeled a prayer for us and shows us how we should pray according to God's will. In Matthew 6, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done. And in Ephesians 5, verse 17, so don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, we can understand what the will of God is by his word, um, by what is written by the authors over the ages, inspired by him. And it's easier for us now with our Bibles and technology, but at the time, the New Testament was, was a bunch of letters circulating among the churches. Don't be foolish, Ephesians says. Read his word, understand his will. It's foolishness not to. And to pray according to his will. In saying that, I shouldn't be praying for anything that goes against what's written in the Bible. I shouldn't pray for another man's life or pray for harm against another believer or anyone else for that matter. But if we do pray according to his, to his will, we know that he hears us and we trust that our prayers are heard. We should then have faith that our prayers will be answered, that the will of God will be carried out. In Matthew, Jesus teaches about praying in faith. Matthew 21, verse 32. And if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. In Luke 18, Jesus talks about the importance of praying with perseverance. The, par the parable of the persistent widow. That is, if an unjust judge who doesn't fear God or respect men can grant a widow justice through her persistence, Luke 18, verse 7, tells us, Will God not grant justice to his elect, who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? Now in Psalm 66, verse 18, we see how obedience plays into it. It says, If I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And we see how disobedience can hinder prayer, the answer of prayers. 
And these are example, examples of what effective prayer looks like in faith, perseverance, and obedience. All of which I believe are included in praying according to God's will. You see, it's not just what we pray for that should be according to God's will, but it's how we pray. In faith, in perseverance, and in obedience. Now this next part is um, easy to get lost in. I know I, I struggled a bit when I first uh, read it, and it's, it's uh, this idea of sin unto death and, and sin that doesn't lead to death. Uh, reading in verse 16. If anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin that doesn't lead to death, he should ask and God will give life to him, to those who commit sin that doesn't lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is sin that doesn't lead to death. Now we know that without the grace of God that is shown to us through Christ, all sin leads to spiritual death. But John isn't talking about spiritual death here because he's addressing believers. He's addressing the Christians of the time. And we know that a believer cannot experience spiritual death because that issue has been dealt with on the cross. So we are reading here about a physical death. If you have a brother or a sister who is caught up in sin, then we need to pray for that person because it's dangerous ground. Verse 16, if anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin that doesn't lead to death, he should ask and God will give life to him. So if a believer is committing a sin that doesn't lead to death, such as maybe lying or, or stealing or maybe just the way that we speak, these are things that we all should be praying for. If a brother or sister is involved in these sins, we should pray for that person and trust that God is faithful to help them overcome these things. And these are sins that don't lead to death. But we do know, however, that there is sin that leads to death. And we see this on different occasions in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. There have been times where because of disobedience, God has decided to end a person's life. But that doesn't necessarily mean that person will experience spiritual death. John is talking to believers here. Now Moses, for instance, is someone from his disobedience to God, was told by God when he will die and where he will die. If we could all turn to Deuteronomy 32, um, verse 50. And it reads, Then you will die on the mountain that you go up, and you will be gathered to your people, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor. And was gathered to his people. For both of you broke faith with me among the Israelites at the waters of Meribeth Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin by failing to treat me as holy in their presence. Now we see here in Deuteronomy that through Moses' disobedience, God chose, God told him when he was going to die and where he was going to die. And even though he, he received this judgment from God, he still remains one of the greatest people, biblical figures today. So we know that disobedience leads to physical death, but not spiritual. Another example is in Acts 5, in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, uh, where they are caught keep, uh, withholding the proceeds from, the, from selling the land and trying to deceive the Holy Spirit. When they're confronted by Peter, they drop dead. However, nothing in the text tells us that they lost their salvation or implies that they weren't Christians. They just got caught up in a sin, trying to deceive the Holy Spirit. Another example is in Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29 to 30. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. So there are cases where believers may disobey God, disobey God, and God passes this particular judgment on them. Even today, we know there are sins that are, may lead a believer to physical death. Maybe drug abuse, alcohol abuse, violent lifestyles, criminal lifestyles, even hatred. Nevertheless, 
Just like the case of Moses, Ananias, and Sapphira, the root is a disobedience to God. And as believers, we will be held accountable for knowing what is right and doing what is wrong. The Bible tells us, for whom much is given, much will be required. Believers must be aware that there is sin unto physical death. There is sin that we can commit as believers that will lead us to death. And yet, in John, he doesn't tell us, in 1 John 5, he doesn't tell us to pray about these things. And I think that a passage in 1 Corinthians 5 can help to explain. Now, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul is writing to the people of Corinth about sexually immoral behavior that isn't, toler that isn't even tolerated among the Gentiles, but is present among the people, the church in Corinth. Chapter 5, verse 3. Even though I'm absent in the body, I am present in spirit, as one who is present with you in this way. I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, I am with you in spirit. With the power of our Lord Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for this destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Further on, Paul warns about associating with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister in the Lord, and yet is sexually immoral, greedy, an idolater, verbally abusive, a drunkard, or a swindler. Paul says, do not even eat with such a person. So when John says not to pray for these who commit sin unto death, we can tell that there is a point where a believer should be left to the judgment of God. And we know by association our walk with the Lord can suffer if we do stay in, in the midst of these people. Now reading on to 1 John, 8, uh, 1 John 5 verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin, but the one who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. And there's two points that I think John is trying to get at here. One, that anyone born of God does not sin. As a born-again born believer, God lives in us. And it's that nature that sin cannot come from. But we still do sin. And this comes from the old sinful nature that is still resident in us until the day we die. Secondly, the one who is born of God keeps us safe from the evil one. And he cannot harm, cannot harm him. Now, why would John make such a statement? It's a bold statement to say the devil can't harm you. I know a lot of people would, would, would question that. But I believe John says this because he knows, because he was there. Because John was there when Jesus prayed in the Gospel of John 17, verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect, him, protect them from the evil one. Now, we can allow sin into our life. But apart from, as Paul would say, giving the devil a foothold, Satan doesn't have the freedom to do whatever he wants in our lives. We have a promise that we can cling to. Jesus prayed on that night that you and I would be kept safe. We don't have to be afraid. Verse 19 and 20. We know that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one, that is, in the Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And at the time, John understands Satan's temporary role as ruler of this world. The world is under the sway of the evil one. And we are not, we are not of this world. We are of God and we are his children. And it's the Holy Spirit of the believer that lives inside the believer and not in the unbeliever that makes a difference. I think if we go back to 1 John 3, verses 1 and 6. The second half of verse 1. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. In verse 6. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. It's 
To tie it all up, to tie it all up, John is telling the church that you can know for sure. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 5, test yourselves to see that you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? Are we born of God? Are we born of his spirit? Are there signs that God's spirit is making a difference in our lives? Because it is only, through, only in the true begotten son of God that we have eternal life. Heavenly Father, thank you for this fellowship, Lord, that we're able to come together and share, Lord. Thank you for your word and that we can trust your word. I pray that um, each of us would find encouragement in what was shared here today. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Alan.